Emmanuel Faith is my church home because I was able to build a community of people that continue to surround me today. I come to Emmanuel Faith because of the community and the teaching. I love Emmanuel Faith for the kids groups and the amazing youth groups. My kids love coming here. They never want to miss church um, and for just all the people that go here. I love Emmanuel Faith because it is a church that cares for its community with its projects with Lovesco that serves and loves its neighbors. I have never had any doubts about the fact that this is where I belong in, in church. Oh, I love that. I love this church too. And I gotta say, sitting here this morning with you all and experiencing that worship, oh, I love that this is a church that worships the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's right. That's right. Well, um, this, uh, this morning, um, I want to begin by just pointing out that I grew up, I grew up thinking that, that there were going to be certain things that were going to be more of a problem in the real world. You know, like that there was going to be things that we were going to experience more of. For, you know, for instance, um, stop, drop, and roll. I mean, we trained for this. But I have never once done it, you know? I haven't, I haven't lived it out. You know, there's a um, quicksand. All the movies made it sound like it was gonna happen all the time, but, but it's not an issue, right? You know, um, pennies falling from skyscrapers, they were gonna kill so many people. I was really nervous about that. Uh, the hole in the ozone layer, I think that's it. <laughs> no one's talking about it anymore. Um, but, you know, killer bees and, and piranhas and, and the, 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 the razor blades and, and, you know, Halloween candy, that, that was all stuff that I thought would be a bigger problem in this world. And yet, those aren't the problems that we face. I, I think in our text today, we're going to see what has always been the problem. The problem has always been that sin separates us from God. We're going to see today that sin is a bigger deal than we ever realized. It's a bigger deal than I realized. Uh, it's a bigger deal than even you realized. And this is what this passage of Scripture today is all about. This week is uh, week four of a five-week study on the most exciting book in our Bible, Okay, maybe not, not really. If you're joining us for the first time, either here or online or in the chapel, I want to say welcome and thank you for being here. Um, uh, we are talking about a book of Leviticus. You know, there's so many people who just said, I would come to church if you talked more about Leviticus. <laughs> okay, not really, not really. Um, but this is, is a series that we're calling Altered Lives because all of these all of these sacrifices are about approaching the altar and our lives become this. And so this is a series on Leviticus sponsored by the 699 flowers from Trader Joe's. Remember? <laughs> not, not to be confused with the 999 bouquet of flowers. No. All right. You had to be there the last few weeks to, to catch that one. Um, <laughs> but uh, we are going to be today talking about the price of purification. Because as, as our lives are altered, it's, it's a price that is paid. And that price is the price of purification. And so uh, today in our study of Levit Leviticus, we're going to be in chapter 4. And so uh, please open up and turn with me. We're going to jump around from chapter 4 to the, about the middle of chapter 5. And we've got a lot to cover today. And so uh, get ready Get ready to flip around, all right? Um, uh, this sacrifice that we're going to talk about today, in my Bible, the top, the top uh, says that this is the, the laws of the sin sacrifice, all right? So it, just to remind you, we've, kinda, we've talked about the burnt sacrifice. We've talked about grain sacrifice. We've talked about peace sacrifice. And now we're going to talk about the sin sacrifice. Now, I want to suggest that this sacrifice is the one that we typically think about when we think about sacrifice. It's, it's the most uh, like kind of mathematical of all sacrifices. 
In a sense, it's like, you know, you, you, you sin, so I take an animal. And that animal covers my, my sin. So it's very much like I did this, and so I do this, and now this, right? So that's this sacrifice. Now, we've been talking about how these sacrifices are drawing near things. And this is going to be one that does the same thing. But we're going to talk a little bit about how and why today. And so in the first verse of chapter 4, it says this, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If anyone sins, now get this though, unintentionally in any, in any of the Lord's commands about things not to be done, and does any one of them. Now, just want you to point out something. This is talking about unintentional sins. And this is why I want you to understand that sin is a much bigger deal than we realize. It is a much bigger problem. Because if it's unintentional sin, that means that um, the intentions of your sin don't really matter. I still um, remember the time when my daughter, that she learned about the particular offense that comes with the singular use of the middle finger. Okay? Um, she, apparently, it's, it's not always nice to give someone a bird. Um, and she learned that because um, she saw people doing this somewhere, and they, it was kind of fun, and you know, she seemed like it was, it was nice. They smiled and, and flipped each other off, and so she came home and decided to, um, to give the one-finger salute to her brother. Well, her brother, um, her brother knew a thing or two, and come to find out, he or her parents <laughs> did not find it quite as funny, right? See, her intentions were, were actually good, but according to this passage, the intentions don't really matter. You can still sin unintentionally. But now, um, what about ignorance? Okay, because now if, if uh, I mean... If I didn't know it was a sin, is it still a sin? You know, when, when the cop pulls you over and, and you say, oh, officer, I didn't know I was speeding. How does that work for you? Right? Uh, ignorance is not an excuse, apparently. Then in, in chapter 5, Leviticus 5.1, it says, If anyone sins in that he hears a public adjuration to testify... And though he is a witness, whether he has seen or come to know the matter, yet does not speak, he shall bear his iniquity. So now what we find is that if you don't do something that you're supposed to do, that that is a sin. If you fail to do what you're supposed to do, or even if you just forget, what if I just forgot? Oh no, I didn't do it. Well, guess what? That's still a sin. Sin is a bigger deal than we ever realized. And this is today a reminder to us all that sin is a big problem. It is our big problem. In fact, it uh, keeps going. In uh, Leviticus 2, if, if anyone touches an unclean thing, whether a carcass of an of a unclean wild animal or a carcass of an unclean livestock or a carcass, there's lots of carcasses, um, of swarming things, and it is hidden from him, he did not even notice it. And he becomes unclean and realizes his guilt. In other words, if all of a sudden you look down and you think, uh-oh, there's blood on my pants. And you think, oh, I leaned up against the counter, right? It, now it's an accident that, that, that just accidents can be sins. So this is a bigger and bigger problem, and then it's not even done. If anyone utters with his lips a rash oath to do evil or to do good, any sort of rash oath that people swear, and it is hidden from him when he comes to know it and realizes his guilt of any of these things, then guess what? Another sacrifice has happened. And so how many of you have ever said to a kid, if you don't stop this, then you're going to lose that for a month, right? 
No, just me, I guess, just me. All right, I've made the rash oath. I've just been unwise with my words. All of this is still sin. Now, the reason that I can say that this is a bigger deal is that I tend to think, I tend to operate as if sin is only the thing that I choose to do. Okay, now, of course, that is sin. However, it seems like what Scripture is saying is that it is so much more, that we sin without even knowing it. It's, it's as if maybe there's a part of our nature that is sinful, right? That, that's what this is getting at. That that's, that's why it's such a big problem. And influence, influence only makes matters worse. Influence only makes, makes matters worse. So let me just kind of um, breeze through here. Um, if you look at verse three, I want you to notice that there's a, a, a gr- the greater influence that people have over people and with people, the bigger the, act, the, the sacrifice is. Okay, so it actually starts in this order throughout this text of Leviticus 4, and it begins in verse 3. It says, if the anointed priest, okay, now this is most likely the high priest, if that priest sins and thus brings on the people, guilt on the people, so his sin affects others, then a bull from the herd without blemish must be offered. Okay, then if you skip down to verse 13, It says, if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally. By the way, I mean, this we don't even have time to talk about, but did you know that there are communal sins that we together can sin and we don't even know it until later we look back and say, wow, that was not great what we did. We need to repent of that. That's a biblical concept. And which means that it doesn't even have to be that you individually were the one who sinned, but you were a part of a society that did. That's what's going on here. But sure enough, if that happens, then a bull from the herd is chosen. Now, the first, the priest had to choose a bull without blemish. This one is just any bull. And so we've kind of got a little bit lesser payment. But then verse 22, if a leader sins, he shall bring his offering, a goat, a male, a male without blemish. That's a leader. But then skip down to verse 27. If a common person sins, he shall bring for his offering a goat, a female without blemish. I'm not, um, I'm not a shepherd, but apparently the, the males were um, more valuable than the females, okay? But here's the point. Apparently, not all sins are even equal. Not all sins are equal. Leaders have, a, 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 to have to sacrifice more to cover these sins, more expensive animals, but not because they are more important to God. Okay? Leaders, leaders the priest, is not more important to God than the individual, than the common person. However, Leaders have to sacrifice more because of how their interact, their, their influence affects more people. You see, God doesn't just hate sin because he hates it when people break rules. He hates sin because what it does to people. And when a leader sins, when the high priest sins, that affects the relationship to the entire to all people. That's what God is, so, why God's so angry about sin. He's not just up there saying, I, I really like my rules. No, he knows that sin hurts people. And that's why, that's why we have this gradation here. And if you remember throughout this series, we've been suggesting that the sacrifices in Leviticus are drawing near things. Okay, they're, they're there to bring us closer to God. That means that, that, that they're the way that sinful humans were allowed to approach a holy God. You see, the sin problem, it had to be dealt with. Okay? As I said, the, the, the biggest problem that we face is this separation that sin causes in our lives. And that had to be dealt with in order for God 
to move in and through his people. So now, I just want to ask, do we want to be a people that God moves in our midst? Do we? I I didn't hear you, chapel. Do you? Okay. Okay, good. Um, we, we want to be that people, right? Well, if we're going to be that people, the key is in this picture of purification that is here in this text. You see, throughout the series, we've been saying this, that, that the sacrifices in Leviticus paint pictures that create a pathway to enter God's presence. And today... The pathway, the picture that we are, is painted here is a picture of purification, of purification. See, what the sin sacrifice did was purify us. But the point is, though, that um, the sin sacrifice, and this is really true of all sacrifice, biblical sacrifice, This is a huge distinction between biblical sacrifice and pagan sacrifice. Pagan sacrifice tends to be a sacrifice for the God, the deity. Biblical sacrifice is not for God. God is not sitting up there thinking to himself, I just need some more dead animals. That's not... That's not at all what's going on. It is not, it's not like a gift to God. Sacrifice. Sacrifice was always for the people. It, this, is, this is a huge distinction. That the sacrifice is for people because it's the people who needed to be cleansed. It's the people who needed purification. And so God moves among his people, among the people who are made pure by a sacrifice. God moves among his people, among the people who are made pure by a sacrifice. And so it's really important that we understand how and why this this purification is provided. Okay, so this purification, the first thing that I want to point out is that this purification was provided by the guilty party. Okay, it's very important that the guilty party is the one who provides this, this sacrifice. So... The guilty person um, had to supply the sacrifice, and, and it would have been at great expense, all right? So now, I had to do some research, and I looked up in today's dollars. In today's dollars, a bull, a bull can range between five and $10,000. Now, um, a, a goat can be worth up to, depending on the, how like unblemished, can be up to $2,000, now, now, a sheep, okay, good news, only four to $500, but still, do you want to be sacrificing one of those every time you accidentally sin? And yet, this is the cost of sin. It was not cheap. Leviticus I mean, later on, I mean, good news though, later on in Leviticus, there, there's, these animals were the ones that, that leaders had to sacrifice, the common person. It, later in Leviticus, it does tell us that if anyone, if he cannot afford a lamb, then he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for the sins that he has committed two turtle doves or two pigeons. So the good news was that God was always gracious to people um, in any economic situation. You could still come before the Lord and still find this covering and this forgiveness, but it's clear that this purification offering had to come from the guilty party. But then in each of these offerings, something interesting happens. Now, and this is where in Leviticus you get a bit repetitive, okay? It, it'll say an offering and then it, it talks about it and then you, you kind of, you need to read it again and it says almost the same thing. And it takes a little work to to kind of figure out what it's not saying to one and the other. However, in all of them, one thing is clear. This is incredibly important. And this is that the bodies of the animal. Okay, now, and I'm talking about the the flesh. Okay, the organs, the, the, the stuff of the animal. It 
it's not the main focus. It's not the main focus of a sacrifice. In fact, um, a small portion, okay, it'll talk about the fat and the, the liver and those kind of pieces. A part of the animal is actually burnt in the ritual, okay, in the, in, in the, the, the tabernacle. It's not in the holy of, uh, holies or in the tent of meeting. It's not there. It's outside of that. The only piece, the only part of the animal that is brought into the tent of the meeting, which is the closest place that, that humans were allowed to enter, to, be, to get close to, to God, the presence of God, except for the one day that one priest could enter into the Holy of Holies. This was the, the next closest place that any human would ever come. And the only thing that's brought in is blood. Blood in every single one of these. This is the one thing that they all have in common. That it's blood that is brought in. Here's, here's an example of it. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of the fragrance of incense. That's inside the tent of meeting. Before the Lord. That is in the tent of meeting. It says, and all of the rest of the blood of the bull he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering. Okay, That's outside. And that, that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. See, this is the key part. Blood is important here. But the reason, the reason that this blood had to go inside the tent of meeting is that, that sin doesn't just, doesn't just anger God. It actually... It actually messes up. It, it gets between us. And it, it makes the place where humanity and deity meet. It makes it dirty and unclean. And it makes it not possible for us to meet with God. That's what sin does to us. And this was a picture of that very thing. And so that's why the sacrifice of purification was provided in the place of meeting. That's why the blood is taken in there. That's why the blood is so important here. But have, have you ever wondered why blood is so important? I mean, why all of this just for, for the blood? Because actually in some of the, in some of the sacrifices, um, the, the, the most important pieces of it aren't even used. So in some of the sacrifices, the most important pieces are actually burned outside the city. The, the skin, the meat, the, all the stuff that we would use is burned outside the city even. It's the blood. And here's why. Levit Leviticus 17 tells us this, that the life of a creature is in the blood. The life of the creature is in the blood. And I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves. Okay, the word atonement, to, to cover, to make a covering for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Now, the, the word life here is the, the word nefesh. And, and it, it's the same word for soul. Um, it is nefesh. When God breathes into Adam... He is animated with nefesh, with soul. It is the stuff that gives him life. It is the animating force that all of us have and experience. And this, this was considered to be a part of the blood that does that. So while us as, you know, modern Western thinkers, we tend to think of Blood as relating to death. So blood is a sign of death, right? Now, but that, we have to just kind of put on a different mindset. We have to change that completely. For the Hebrew mindset, blood was a sign of life, not death. And so it's only life that can counteract the sin that brings death. It is the life, the, the, the blood, the, the life force in an animal that counteracts that. It is only life that makes atonement for life. The life, the soul of this animal. 
that is sacrificed, it is given for you. It is given for the people. It takes the stain of sin away. And if you wanted to be clean before approaching God, you, you, you wanted it to be clean, not if. You, you needed to be clean or bad things happen. Bad things happen when unclean people come before a holy God. Okay, all throughout scripture, there's stories after stories of people um, coming close to God and getting in trouble. Um, one guy touches the ark and he's actually trying to help the ark and, and he drops over dead because sinful humans cannot be close to holy, to pure holiness. And so the picture that, of this sacrifice is one that was provided for protection from God's holiness. That we actually need to be protected from God's holiness. And you see, um, God's holiness and human sinfulness are just incompatible. Okay, they're, they're like the opposite of, you know, the magnets that repel each other, right? They just don't work together. It's, it's just not possible. And however, it's not always the way that we think or the way that we talk about it. And I have to say, I, I often hear people trying to explain this concept and they, they just, they say it the wrong way. I want to admit to you that I have taught this the wrong way before. It's a complicated situation, but I've often heard statements, something to, like this, that a holy God cannot be in the presence of sinful people. Okay, now, have you heard that before? You, you know, you might have said that before, and, and it's close to what we're talking about, okay? Because what we're saying is that sin separates. It does. And, and sin is incompatible. It is. That there's this repelling nature to it. That's absolutely true. However, the problem with this statement is literally every single place that God interacts with humans. Every single one is God pursuing us. Uh, Garden of Eden, day one of sin. Adam and Eve sin, and God does not say, Ah, stay away! I can't be in your presence anymore. No, God says, where are you? Come here. Come to me. I want to be with you. You see, it's the exact opposite of this. It is not that God cannot be in the presence of sinful humans. It's that sinful humans cannot be in the presence of of a holy God. This is why we need purification before we can enter into holiness, before we can be in relationship with God. This is so very important. If you remember the problem at the end of Exodus, Exodus ends, there's a tabernacle, but the people can't go in. This is why they can't go in because there's this, there's this scary presence of God there. Okay, that, that we talk about the fear of God. That, that is exactly what we should fear. Entering as sinful humans. That is a scary place to be. You see, because the, the ark contained the the like purest form of the, the expression of God that has ever been condensed in one place. That was where the ark was and it was only hidden by a relatively small curtain. But every, every piece of the tabernacle was designed to, to protect people from getting too close. See, It was dangerous, and if you were an unclean person and you got too close, that was bad for you, and that's why it was only the priests and only with blood on their hands that would enter even close. In other words, though, it was offered at the price of a life. 
See, it is blood that represents life more than, it, than death. However, you didn't get blood without a death. And so it was the price of a life that was paid for our sin. But not just any life. You see, these were, um, these were people that lived amongst their, their animals. Okay, they, they, the, any meat that they ate, they, you know, they raised that animal. They knew that animal. Okay, they, that animal might have had a personality that was different than other animals. And when they slaughtered those animals, it was a part of their, their family even. This was a part of their possession. They own this. And, and so it's a very different thing. These are people that cleaned them, fed them. Oftentimes, they might have been there to help them be born. There's a different connection with the animal than we have, than the, the meat that they eat than we have. And yet, I want you to see this. Leviticus 4.29 says, okay, this is about the common person who is sacrificing. And he shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and kill the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. Now get this. I, I've never noticed this before. I always thought the priest did the killing. But what this is saying is that when you sinned, even unintentionally, you had to come and take your animal, an animal that you had raised, that you'd cared for. You had to be the one to place your hand on the animal. And you had to be the one to cut that animal's throat. You had to be the one that killed it. Now, I know it's gruesome. And I think that's the point. That sin is a much bigger deal than we ever realized. And so it's not just a, a, a financial cost. There's, a, there's an emotional, guttural aspect to this. That we are connected to it in a powerful way. And once again, God wasn't just wanting something to die. I think that the important piece of this is that there was a laying on of hands. And in that moment, it's not a, it's not, there's not an image here of a transferring of guilt or anything like that. But what it is, is a confession of guilt. It's, it's saying, I did this. Because what if, what if it was your sin that you had to go out and kill an animal for? It's saying, I made this mistake. I am the sinner. You know what this is? It's, it's confession. You see, God moves. God moves in, in and among people who are made pure. And I've, I've been saying they've been made pure by a sacrifice, specifically a sacrifice of blood. But really, the way that we are made pure is when we confess. You guys, God moves when his people confess sin. When people confess their sin to each other, when they confess sin to God, that's when God moves you know, because it, it's a purifying thing. Because God wants to purify. And this is true today more than ever. Revival always begins when people start confessing sins. When they even start confessing the ones they didn't know were sins. When they pray to God, search me, know me, find, see if there be any way in me. It is against your ways, right? That, that's what we're asking See, when people confess their sins over a sacrifice, God moves in powerful ways. However, the big difference that we have that they didn't is that we confess our sins over a different sacrifice, over a much better sacrifice. So the author of Hebrews is writing about this very sacrifice. Okay, and when he writes this in, in Hebrews 10, 
He says, every priest stands daily. Remember, this is something they did all the time. Daily, they were making sacrifices at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Did you get catch that? Wait, it could never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool at his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Okay, let me just highlight this one piece, though. I think that is so important that the the author of Hebrews is getting at. He says it again in Hebrews 10.4. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Okay, hold on here. You're telling me that all of those animals that were sacrificed at the tabernacle, okay, then there were two different versions of the temple, okay, daily sacrifices, okay, you remember there was a burnt offering. In a sense, that's kind of the the, the offering that takes away the, the idea of sin in theory. And and these are the now the sacrifices that take away individual sins. That every time I do this, I have to bring this offering. Are you telling me, author of Hebrews, that all those sacrifices never actually took away sins? All they did was cover. All they did was just hide it a little bit. And sure enough, time And time again, it needed more covering and more covering and more covering. It was a temporary cleaning at best. It was always a picture, but that picture was pointing to something else. To where our true, the true price of our purification comes from. You know, um, Jesus gets at this. In fact, in, in, in Luke 5, in Luke 5, I love this. Jesus, um, he, he runs into a, another, another one of the unclean people that he always interacted with. Okay? The, the sinners that he was with, and this one is unclean in that he has leprosy. And it says that, that while he was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing You can make me clean, okay? What is this man doing? He is recognizing who it is that can make him clean. Okay, none of the other sacrifices that he could give were ever making him clean. He goes to Jesus. Jesus can. Jesus says this. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. Beautiful thing just alone that he would touch uncleanness, okay? Um, No one else would do this because then they would be unclean, but Jesus was way above that. So Jesus touches the man. He says, I am willing. Be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. But, and get this, then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, to, but show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifices. What Jesus is saying, hey, offer this sacrifice. This is the sacrifice that you need to offer. Okay, he probably couldn't afford anything but, but you know, probably a, two turtle doves or something. But he offers the sacrifice that Moses commanded for your cleansing, for your purification. This is what's happening in Leviticus 4. But get this. It is a testimony to them. What Jesus is recognizing, which it just is a little weird that Jesus is commanding um, someone to do sacrifices, right? You know, kind of like, Jesus, wait, you're the sacrifice. You, you don't need to, we don't need to, to sacrifice animals anymore is kind of what I want to say. But Jesus is saying, oh, no, 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 wait, that was always a picture. That was always a testimony to something else. That was a testimony. It was pointing to where the real purification came from. And that was only and always through Jesus. See, God moves among people who are made pure by confession on on the sacrifice of Jesus. That's when, that's when we are made pure. And that's when we can hold on to the promise of 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess 
our sin. Any sin, accidental sins, sins that we're ignorant of, okay, unwise, all that stuff. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Ah, this is the amazing gift that we have. And he can only do it because Jesus fulfills all of the sin sacrifice. All of it. We, we often talk about him as the lamb. I think we sang a song about it today. But he's more than just the lamb. I want you to see this. Okay? And I know it's kind of an, an ugly slide, but it's worth it. Because purification was provided by the guilty party. Jesus becomes the guilty party. He put on flesh. He became the guilty party so that we can become more fully human. It was in the meeting place. Well, guess what? Jesus actually is the temple where, where, where humanity and deity come together. He was the place where heaven and earth collides. And he does that. Oh, he shall lay the... the let me go to Leviticus 4. That's not the right verse. Let's just go here. Um, a true temple. I'm going to take that one out next time. Um, <laughs> um, so that we can become a true temple. Jesus becomes the temple so that we can become a true temple. Sin sacrifice was made to protect us from God. Well, guess what? Jesus came as God himself, that he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. He became a servant. And so we too now can become like God in holiness. And because he did, and because he sacrificed and became obedient to death and even death on the cross, that we too can now live as a sacrifice for others. See, Jesus fulfilled the entire thing so that we can now live differently. And so the way I want you to say this, you're gonna have to add some, a little space in your notes, okay? Because I've done it a little backwards and here's how I want you to see it. Here's what I want you to say, is that, Jesus, Jesus paid the price of our purification so that we can become a sacrifice for others. You see, he became a sacrifice so we can become a sacrifice for others. We've been talking about this a bunch here, that we are called to be a living sacrifice, right? Now, just think about what every sacrifice does. Every sacrifice that we've been talking about is the thing that is given for another. A sacrifice was always given for someone else. Okay, now in this case, it was given for the one who, who needed it, for the guilty party. And when we are told, we're invited to, to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, um, guess what? God does not need your sacrifices. He never has. But you know who does? Other people. We are called to be a sacrifice, to be the drawing near thing that invites, that encourages, that makes a way for others to come into the presence of God. That's what it means to be and to live as a sacrifice. And this is why our calling is so important. That we, we are challenged to go, to invite, to share the love of God. I got to tell you, there's something powerful about an invitation. Um, when I was in, in, in high school, um, I was 15 years old, and uh, I was, um, I, I was a you know, relatively popular kid, actually. I wasn't, I wasn't you know, the, 
the large, massive man that I am today. But um, <laughs> um, I was, um, I, you know, I looked on the outside like I had it together. I, I, I actually had, had uh, sophomore year, I was sophomore class president. <laughs> um, on the outside, people would have looked at me and said, wow, that kid's got it together. But little did they know that deep inside, I was, I was dealing with all sorts of insecurities. There was sin in my life that was plaguing me, that I felt guilty all the time, and I didn't know how to deal with it. And to make matters worse, I was starting to doubt the faith that I had grown up with. My parents' faith at the time was one that I didn't know was mine. And so I started, I started leaving the community where I would find that hope. I started, I started leaving church and not wanting to go and, and, and stepping away. And I was getting into more and more trouble until, until a guy, guy by the name of Otis, he invited me to this thing called Club. And Club was a, a program that was, that was done by Young Life, which is a ministry that, to, to reach out to people that were lost like me. And sure enough, he invited me he took a risk and invited me, and I said, okay. And it was there, that, it was there that I understood for the first time what Jesus had done for me. It was there that I found a community even that I could confess my sin and find healing and find purification. It was there that I trusted Jesus. It was there that I decided to follow Jesus as a disciple. It was there that I got the first sense of God's calling into ministry. If I hadn't gotten that one invitation, I don't know where I would be today, but it probably wouldn't be here. And it was all because somebody took a risk and, yeah, was it a sacrifice? Yeah. And all that to say, I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. The next two weeks we have... Will you live as a sacrifice? Will you offer yourself as a sacrifice in maybe the simplest way? I want to show you my wallet. It's not full of money. Um, <laughs> it, it, is, it actually has these, uh, um, these invites for Easter in them. Little tiny card designed to fit in your wallet or your pocket or somewhere. Um, on the way out today... There's going to be people who have a bunch of these. We have over 5,000 of these, and I want, you know, I, I want them gone today. Um, because what a simple and powerful gesture that you can do to, to think about, to pray about. Who is it in your life? Who do you run across on a regular basis that you can just invite to church, invite to Easter where they can hear the good news and maybe, maybe their life will be changed. I pray that you and I and us can live as a living sacrifice. Let me pray. Lord, I do thank you. Thank you so much for the amazing gift that you have given us. Oh, I'm so thankful for your scriptures and what a blessing it is to study these ancient sacrifices as we prepare to be ready to receive, to, to, to learn about, to be reminded about the greatest sacrifice of all time, of Jesus, what you gave us. What a blessing this is. And so, Lord, we just pray that even the small ways we can live as a sacrifice. We just pray now for all the people who need this. Lord, we are so blessed to be able to draw near to you, and yet we just recognize there are people in our lives, there are people around us that cannot, that need, they need to have a drawing near thing, invite them, bring them closer. Lord, I just pray that we would be those people, that we would live as those sacrifices for the sake of others. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.